morning and uh, welcome to Central Christian Church's online service. Uh, my name is, is uh, Carl Ruby and I'm the pastor here and it's a, a privilege to, to welcome you today. Hey, this has been a good week for us to support one another uh, in our prayers. I want to remind you of some of the prayer needs that exist for our church family. Uh, Chet Stratton has been in the hospital this week with a uh, case of pneumonia. We have another member in the hospital. Uh, Kim Mulkey begins, has begun her chemotherapy. Uh, so there are a lot of things to pray about. Um, also be praying for our community, uh, be praying for our nation, uh, really for people all over the world as, as together we kind of walk through this strange uh, situation with, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, in the midst of a world that, that's very unsettling, uh, we can put our confidence in a God who loves us and who cares for us and is going to fix everything that is broken if we set our sights on Jesus Christ and live lives according to his teachings. I'm looking forward to uh, reading scripture with you, uh, to coming to the Lord's table together and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and to taking a look at, at Luke chapter 14 and studying another parable that helps us understand the kingdom of heaven. Let me welcome you to our service with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to, uh, to come together. Thank you for the bond that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our counselor and our comforter and our guide. Um, and we thank our, our Father in heaven for all the ways that he blesses us and cares for us. Father, we open ourselves up to you and we, we pray that through coming to the table and through looking at scripture and studying your word, that you would change our hearts and help our hearts to line up with the things that you care about the most. Help us to live lives that, that, that point people to Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, again, we, we come to you with our thanks, and we come to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Before we uh, enter our sanctuary and begin the formal part of our worship service, I want to take a moment and address two issues that are both very difficult to, to address and are fraught with the controversy and, uh, and strong emotions. But, the, but they're issues that are on the uh, forefront of our minds and we need to be careful because sometimes our silence uh, can, can communicate that we're not interested in, in something. First of all, I wanna to talk to the, the challenge of COVID-19. I appreciate your patience with us as we continue to, uh, to work on what the, the best way to handle this as a church we are uh, cautious, we're careful about, we, we are uh, concerned uh, about your safety and we wanna make sure that we handle it in ways that, that respect that. Um, there have been a couple of groups that have met at the church recently. I've hosted three meetings with community leaders to come in and to talk about uh, the policing standards in our community and how we can make sure that, that the most vulnerable members of our community uh, have a say uh, in, in how we approach that. And I have asked everyone who has attended the meetings to practice social distancing. Um, we have set the, t the chairs up at a, a distance from one another, and I asked everyone to wear a mask. And as we begin to uh, reopen uh, certain aspects of our ministry, I would ask you to abide by those, those guidelines. Our senior Bible study, uh, some of the members of that group have expressed a desire to begin meeting with one another. Uh, they will start doing that on Tuesday. We set up the space so that they can spread out. We've asked them all to wear masks if they're going to attend uh, that, that Bible study. And we also ask that you not come to the church if you have been exposed to COVID-19 or if you are experiencing any of the symptoms that are indications that you may have it. And that's a way that you actively uh, love your neighbors, love other members of the congregation, uh, care for the needs of our staff, uh, by doing all that you can to protect those who are around you. The other issue that I want to address is the uh, racial and civil unrest that is gripping our country as long as, as well as the uh, uh, more than a century old practice of discrimination against some of our black and brown uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't have a lot to say on this matter today, but I don't want my silence to be perceived as a lack of interest and concern um, I'm certainly examining my own heart and praying about this 
And I want Central to be a place where we can have healthy, constructive conversations about really difficult topics and where we can actually live out uh, our, our faith in Jesus Christ in ways that help make our community a more healthy place for all of our neighbors. So, so keep that in prayer. And uh, I'm sure we're gonna be coming back to this issue and, and looking for ways as a church to respond in ways that honor the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> for today's uh, scripture, we will be reading Psalm 9. I will praise you, O Lord, with all of my heart. I will tell of all of your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my right and my cause. You have sat on your throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their names forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the people with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. We come to the Lord's table today, both uh, reflecting on, on the deep, deep love of Christ, uh, the immensity of his sacrifice, and we come with a desire to experience his presence and to re be reminded that he is with us. I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a passage we read each week. Uh, as I'm reading the passage, be thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, be thinking about how much he loves you, and be thinking about the fact that through his death, we have access to the power of the resurrection. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please join me in prayer, and then we will take the uh, bread and the cup together. Father, we thank you um, for this opportunity we have to slow down uh, and to remember what you have done for us. Uh, Lord, to remember that, that you endured things that are unspeakable uh, as a desire to identify with our sin, to demonstrate your power over death, to demonstrate the extent of your love, and we thank you for that. Father, we open ourselves up to your Holy Spirit. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be working in us, making us, <clears throat> making us more like Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would uh, open our eyes to areas where we need to confess our sin to you. Make us aware of things that we need to repent from. Father, I, I pray that you would help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, help us to grow in his likeness, to help us to grow in grace, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, take and eat. This is the uh, point in our service where we typically receive our offering. Uh, we'll be doing that uh, online today, or you can send a, a check or a drop-off cash at the church. Um, but thank you again for your generous giving. I'm amazed at how well uh, the ministry of this church has been supported uh, during this time with COVID-19. do want to let you know that we've had a special fund set up specifically for people who are directly affected by a positive diagnosis of COVID-19. And this week we distributed uh, $750 out of that fund, uh, $250 to three different families uh, who have been affected by COVID-19 who all attend Emmanuel Iglesia Hispana, the church that we partner with here in, uh, here in Springfield. 
So that fund is down, I think we have about um, $170 still in it. So if you would like to help replenish that fund, we will continue to distribute that money to people uh, directly affected by the virus. But thank you so much for your generosity. And you can give by texting uh, CC Springfield to the number that's, that's uh, on your screen. <clears throat> hey, I hope you like stories because today's message comes from a story that we find in the middle of the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter uh, chapters 13 and 14. And it's, it's a story where, where once again Jesus is confronting the Pharisees. And they've been giving him a hard time. They don't like the way that Jesus is practicing the Sabbath. And, and what happens is Jesus is much more concerned with the spirit of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves than he is with keeping up with the, the formalities and the expectations of how the religious leaders think Jesus ought to practice the Sabbath. And there's another occasion where Jesus reminds them that, that hey, uh, man wasn't created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for man. It's intended to be a blessing. But we're going to catch up with the story where there have been a series of confrontations uh, around Sabbath. We're going to read one of those stories. And, and these confrontations set the stage for the parable that we're going to be studying today. And the, under, looking at the, these parables in their context is so important. I've come to understand them in, in an entirely new way by realizing that all of them go together in, in a theme of helping us understand what the kingdom of heaven is all about and, and looking at what's happening around them in the scriptures. Because many times when Jesus tells a parable, he's telling it in response to something or he's telling it to address something. And you are going to see that unfold uh, here in today's story. And I'm going to begin by reading a passage from Luke chapter uh, 13. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and he said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days to work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. So here, here is the synagogue leader who, who can't comprehend the, the beauty of this healing that has just taken place because he is caught up in the spirit of legalism and self-righteousness. He, he thinks that, that, that true spirituality, that, that true righteousness is measured by looking just right or, or doing things correctly, a uh, prim and proper way of honoring the Sabbath that's, that's filled with rules and, and, and restrictions. And Jesus on another occasion reminded us that, that man wasn't created for the Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath was, was created for man. Uh, it's a horrible thing when uh, our own made-up rules get in the way of living out the golden rule of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. So, so listen to Jesus' response. And again, remember, uh, Jesus is speaking to power. He is talking to the leaders, the rulers uh, who controlled the, the synagogue. And uh, his response is uh, just a bit confrontational. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he had said this, his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all of the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. So, so he has this confrontation. He, he looks to the, and, and my guess is that this synagogue leader had been uh, wearing down the, the people 
with all his rules and restrictions and self-righteousness and judgmentalism. And they had probably had enough uh, with him. And it probably, it must have been really exciting. I mean, the scripture says they were delighted when Jesus looks this guy in the eye and those who were around him and says, hey, you guys are a bunch of, of hypocrites. <clears throat> The text specifically says that the rulers were humiliated. And I want you to note that word. It's a very important word because Luke uses that word to connect the parable back to this story. He's going to use the word humiliated and humbled here again later in just a little bit. So the Pharisees at that point, they tried to get Jesus to leave the area with a threat about Herod. So let me read this passage. This is uh, verse 31 of Luke chapter 13. And again, this is not what it, what it appears to be on the surface. The passage reads like this. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else because Herod wants to kill you. Uh, they are not trying to help Jesus. They are not looking out for his well-being. They're basically saying, hey, we would like to get rid of you. Uh, stick around here and Herod's going to kill you. Kill you. In reality, they are the ones who wanted to kill Jesus. So they're, they're trying to get him to leave. And I, I want you to listen to Jesus' response. Um, because there's, there's a side of Jesus that you, you don't often see where he's a little, uh, he's a little feisty in, in his, his response. He replied, Jesus replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In other words, you're not going to intimidate me. I'm going to go about my ministry. I'm going to go about my mission without fear of what Herod could do to me. This sets the stage for the parable that is going to be the focus of our message in Romans chapter 14, and I'm going to read this for you. Um, this, is, this is another indication that, that Jesus loves all sinners, uh, including self-righteous sinners. Um, we often focus on the fact that he loved people who, who, who were destitute and living immoral lives and who were tax collectors and drunkards. Jesus, Jesus loves all sinners, but he is especially harsh and confrontational with people who are given to the sin of self-righteousness and to the Pharisees. So let me pick up the story in Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. <clears throat> there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of the body. Let's look at what Jesus is, does right here. He's, he's setting the Pharisees up. And in, instead of going ahead and healing him, he starts first by asking them a question. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and he sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And again, they had nothing to say. That's the context for this parable. Then starting in verse 7, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up here to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all of the other guests. Listen to how Jesus closes the parable. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This reminds me of how Jesus closed one of the parables 
that we studied just a week or so ago, where he closes it by talking about the fact that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. This is another one of those parables where Jesus doesn't offer an explanation, but he immediately goes on to talk about something else that gives us an indication of what this parable is about. It says, Then Jesus said to his host, uh, this, this Pharisee who had invited him over for dinner, uh, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus is not saying that you can never have a, a lunch or a dinner with your brothers and sisters or, or friends. Jesus is speaking specifically to the attitude that these Pharisees have uh, of wanting to invite people uh, of honor and to neglect people who are poor and, and, and oppressed. Let me give you some clues to understanding this parable. First of all, you have to understand what things um, line up with the different aspects of the parable. So the, the wedding host represents God and, and the way that God relates to people in the kingdom of heaven. The invitation to the wedding represents the invitation to enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, those who attempt to grab the best seats represent Pharisees or, or anyone who has a sense of entitlement. Anyone who is proud of who they are, uh, proud of what they, are what they have accomplished, and feels in, in, entitled to be a member of the kingdom of, of heaven. The heroes of the story are those who are willing to put themselves last, uh, stepping aside for the sake of the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. So, so what does this story teach us? What are the points that Jesus is trying to make? I'm going to share four points of this parable that I think will give you an understanding of what Jesus was trying to communicate to us. First of all, the first point is that God will humble people who think too much of themselves. The Pharisees did everything right. They did everything by, by, by the book. They maintained the, the, the outward appearances of righteousness as they understood them in, in their character and in, in, uh, in their culture. And they were very, very proud. And in this parable, Jesus is, is saying, I'm going to humble people who are, are proud. Uh, they will be humiliated in, in the kingdom of heaven if they are relying on their own self-righteousness to, to uh, be a member of, of, Christ, of Christ's kingdom. So that's, that's the first point of this message. It's a reminder of the importance of brokenness and humility. See how this parable goes with the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us the Beatitudes, which are descriptions of the basic fundamental characteristics of kingdom people. Uh, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to mourn over sin. You have to hunger and thirst for righteousness, not feel as though you are already filled with it. You need to be meek, pure in heart, and, and, and a peacemaker. Um, and, and this parable builds on that and says you, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven as a self-righteous person. The next thing that the parable teaches us is that caring for the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind matters deeply to God. Jesus comes back to this theme over and over and over again. And if our hearts are not moved by the needs of the oppressed, we have been missing the message of Jesus. This is all the way through the Old Testament. Um, that, that God's people, one way that God's people set themselves apart was the degree to which they cared for, for widows, orphans, and immigrants. Uh, that's, that, 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 uh, that threesome comes up over and over again in, in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, Jesus keeps talking about uh, our responsibility to provide a justice and fairness and compassion uh, for, for people who are, who are the most vulnerable. 
Um, if, your, if our hearts are not moved by that, something's wrong and we need to repent. The next thing that we see in the parable, the, third, third, the first point was God will humble people who think too much of themselves. Second point is caring for the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind matters deeply to God. The third point is that blessings and rewards in heaven await those who care for the vulnerable. Uh, you want to please God, care for vulnerable people. Uh, we have a group in the church who are working on this right now. Greg Beliveau is putting together a team of people who are going to go into a part of town and serve a meal to another group of people who cannot pay them back. And this is a direct way of obeying what Jesus is talking about. And I believe that there is a reward for those who participate in that. First of all, there is an immediate reward in that, in that um, you're going to get a feel for what heaven is like just by doing it. You're going you're to feel good because your life is lining up with what God cares about. But then there is a long-term reward where God rewards us in heaven because we have lived well. We have lived for the things that move the heart of Jesus when we care for the poor uh, and, the, and the oppressed. Third, here's the fourth and final point to today's message. Hypocrites will find excuses not to care. Entering the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with believing that Jesus is who he says he is and conforming our lives to his teachings. There's another parable, there's another version of this parable told in Matthew chapter 22. Same kind of theme of a, of a person throwing a wedding feast and sending out an invitation and, and inviting people to come. Only in, in the Matthew version of this parable, the, the king invites people to come to the banquet and they all find excuses not to come. One person will say, well, no, I just bought a piece of land. I need to go out and inspect it. Another person says, well, my mother-in-law just died and I've, I've got a funeral to go to. And, and one after another, they, they come up with a reason not to enter the kingdom of heaven, not to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and not to take his teachings to heart. We are at a, a place in history right now where, where, where the stakes are very, very high. Uh, the world around us seems to be changing uh, faster and in more dramatic ways than we could ever have anticipated. And we need to respond but by staying in that moment with the spirit of Jesus Christ. Letting his words, powerful, powerful words like the ones in this parable and the Sermon on the Mount, shape who we are and how we respond. We need to decide who in the story we will identify with. We need to choose not to identify with the hypocrites or the, the synagogue ruler or people, people who hang out and care only about people of their own social status. But we need to identify with the, the heroes of the story, those who throw banquets for people who can't pay them back and open their hearts to the needs of the poor, the lame, the crippled, and the blind. Hey, thank you for going with me on this journey of studying the parables of Jesus. I pray that they will change uh, who we are as individuals and who we are as a church. Hey, God bless you. Um, go out and, and live your lives for the kingdom. Look for people to serve. And while we're not meeting together here on Sunday mornings, remember, uh, this building isn't the church. Uh, you are the church, and you can make a difference in, in our culture, uh, with our neighbors here in our city, and uh, look for ways to do that that honor Christ. Hey, God, God bless you. Hey, thank you uh, for joining me for today's service. I'm going to uh, close with a benediction and just want to encourage you to, to go out this week and live by the words of Jesus Christ. In doing so, uh, you will earn a blessing and a reward in heaven, but, but care for those who are in need. Set, up, set aside our own, our own self-righteousness. Let's humble ourselves together, identify with those who are in need, and uh, conform our lives to the uh, beautiful teachings of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, I want to close uh, with a blessing upon uh, this congregation, and all who uh, uh, participated in today's service. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to take these words to heart. I pray that your Holy Spirit would change us as we wrestle with Scripture, as we wrestle 
with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Father, we come to you asking you for a blessing. Father, we're asking you to reward us. Um, and we're asking you to, to, to reward us, not because we are, are wonderful, self-righteous people, but Lord, reward us because we're trying to be obedient in caring for the poor, the lame, the blind, and the sick. Um, Father, I pray for those in the congregation who, who may be in those categories. And I pray for people who are hurting. And I pray for people who are stressed or who are worried. And Father, you are such an amazingly kind and compassionate and good God. Father, help us, help us to sense who you are and help us to be aware of all that you are doing for us and help us to set 100% of our hope on Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen.